Hi, I'm Mark Upton from Sports Relations, and this is the third part of a presentation I gave a few weeks ago to a group of Level 2 Australian Rules footy coaches. And for those that have seen the previous two sections, will know that we've covered some coach learning and how coaches can develop themselves, and also some player learning or skill acquisition methods, um, particularly around practice design for allowing your players to improve their skill and game understanding. And the third section today is about evaluating performance, and we'll see uh, how Peter Drucker, a famous uh, management guru, uh, is related to that. So the guys that were at the presentation, they just viewed an under-18s game uh, before their course started, or just part of their course that day and just before I presented. And so the question for them was how did they evaluate the game, and whether that was from a team performance, individual player, or a certain uh, aspect of the game, for example, ball movement or defensive transition. And for all of them, the, the main way would have been observation. So observation in real time and with the naked eye or perhaps a pair of binoculars um, is, is the, probably the most common way for coaches to evaluate a performance. And uh, what I found is very helpful in that observation process is to have a checklist. So uh, rather than just rely on uh, perhaps being distracted or consumed with certain things that happen in a game or a training session for that matter, it's often quite helpful to have a checklist with just four or five key points for the certain aspects of performance you want to look at, or if it's a training activity, it might be some questions about you know, how well are the players executing this concept, do they understand it, what's happening off the ball, maybe some key questions to ask players if it's in training, okay, to probe their understanding. So a checklist um, I find is really simple but helpful way to assist in that observation process because there are some flaws with it obviously and we'll cover that in a second. So the second way to evaluate performance is to review it on video. So to be able to have a second look at it and look at specific sections of the performance and multiple times is obviously you know very very helpful in evaluating a performance. And these days, it's it, for coaches at all levels, it should be possible to collect footage because you don't have to go to the extent that this guy has with his camera set up, but a number of devices, whether it's a DV camera or flip cams. Um, smartphones, tablets, they can all be used really by anyone um, that's involved with your club or your team to record a match or record training. And even if that's just once or try, twice during the year, I'm sure you'll find it a really helpful uh, thing to do to, to assist in evaluating that game. And then now sometimes you will have the luxury to have access to video analysis software that will allow you to tag and break the game down or the training session down further to to look at it more closely, but even if it's just in a simple play playback on QuickTime or Windows Media Player, um, you'll find that being able to re video review that performance or that training will be very valuable. So I strongly encourage you, if you don't currently do that as standard practice or you've never done it, have a go at it. Um, I'm sure you'll find it worthwhile. And so then the third method of evaluating performance is perhaps what we more traditionally think in terms of stats or, or hard data, objective data about that performance or that training session. And so why would we do that? Well, we know that from studies that even experienced coaches can only accurately recall perhaps 30 to 50% of key events in a match. And key events could be things that happen off the ball, so they might not actually even observe them at all, they might miss them. So there's some weaknesses there. We also know that there's things uh, called cognitive bias. So everyone has cognitive biases that influence how they interpret and might evaluate um, a performance if they've just observed it live and at one time only. So data and, and video review in fact can help overcome those biases. And so a few tips in terms of using stats and data. I think the first one is whatever data you collect it needs to end up helping you to make decisions as a coach and take action. So it needs to help you evaluate the performance and perhaps tell you something that, you, that wasn't easily observable yourself on your, on your own. So if you're able to observe it with, with the naked eye first up when you're watching the match or the watching the training, you probably don't need to collect the data on it or get anybody to collect data. But if it's stuff that is uh, harder to observe and pick up when you're watching live, then that's the sort of thing that data can be helpful with. But 
ultimately the data you collect needs to drive action. It can't just be nice to know stuff. It needs to actually drop, get to the point where it helps you to make better decisions and take better actions in training design or feedback to players or other areas. As an example of that, we'll take a non-sporting example. So there's a show in Australia called um, uh, Bondi Rescue about lifesavers that go out in the, in the ocean and on the beach and help people out that might get into a bit of trouble. So it's a you know typical real life uh, doco. And what happened with Bondi Rescue? Obviously, people tweet about it as the show's in progress. And the uh, producers of the show actually started to analyse all the tweets that came back and the feedback about the show and the comments that were being made. And what they found by analysing all these is they made the assumption that people liked the dramatic rescues and that was what people tuned in for. But in fact, when they analysed the tweets closer, so analysed the data, they found that it was actually the, the stories behind the guys on the show. So some of you know, their home life or something that happened to them, the reason maybe they'd become lifesavers, for example. They were the, or lifeguards, they were the, the things that actually attracted the audience and they enjoyed. So they started to change the content of the show to include a few more of those sort of background stories on the, on the guys that appear in the show. So that's an example where data that's been collected has clearly led to action, in this case changing content, but in a sporting example, you know, the action might be training design, playing strategy, feedback to players, uh, that sort of thing is the action that you hopefully want to come out of the data you collect. And we mentioned Peter Drucker at the start, uh, a uh, well-known management guru, and he said about not worrying about beginning with the answers, but actually start with the questions. So the questions in our case would be, what do we want to know about performance and what aspect of performance do we want to know? Sometimes there's, in a lot of sports, there's traditional stats. So they're, they're the answers and we just start with them. Oh, okay, you know, we know how many, we can find out how many passes we had or how many contested balls we had or how many attacking third entries we had. But they're the answers. But what we want to start with are what are the questions about our performance on the ball or off the ball? So as an example, in the previous section, we, we looked at skill acquisition methods for players learning to play in tight spaces. So the question about our performance in that aspect might be how well, when we won the ball in a tight space, were we able to retain possession and come up with a measure or a metric for that? that gives us an indication of how we're tracking and hopefully improving across the weeks and our ability to win the ball and keep possession of the ball when we're playing in congestion or under high pressure. That's an example of starting with the question and then thinking about the data that might be best to collect to answer that question. And the third tip really is, is be prepared for, at times, the data will back up your subjective observations but other times it will conflict with what you've perceived or, or viewed on the day. So just be prepared and open-minded enough to let the data challenge you when it's not in agreement. Doesn't mean that you have to always then go with what the data says, but you just need to consider it, take it on board, and then make what you think is the best decision or take the best action going forward. So that was our section on evaluating performance.